In the year 2186, the civilizations of the galaxy are at war with a relentless artificial enemy called the Reapers. Commander Shepard's warnings of their arrival were all ignored, and now the Reapers have invaded the galaxy in force, crushing all resistance. The Reapers are pressing into the galaxy on all fronts, and it is only a matter of time before the races of Citadel space are crushed beneath their onslaught. But there is still hope. Commander Shepard has assembled a crew of trusted allies, the Systems Alliance stealth frigate, the Normandy. Shepard and the Normandy crew are racing to forge alliances, build a unified front capable of defeating the Reapers before they overtake the galaxy and complete their harvest of all biological life. All the while, the insidious terrorist organization Cerberus advances their own agenda of human supremacy at any cost, led by the mysterious, elusive man and his army of ruthless operatives. back to Foster the Meeple, a channel all about board games and board gamey things. Today I am here to do a how to play for the game Mass Effect the board game Priority Hagalaz from Modifius Entertainment who very kindly sponsored this video. Mass Effect Priority Hagalaz is a cooperative tactical action game for one to four players following the crew of the Normandy as they infiltrate a downed Cerberus cruiser. The game takes place over a campaign of three main missions and two optional loyalty missions, which can be played in a single sitting or split across multiple play sessions. Just so everybody knows, the pre-order is now live and the game is officially going to launch and be released in October. All the information and everything you need, of course, is down in the description below, so please feel free to click the links if you are so interested. So without further ado, let's learn how to play Mass Effect Priority Hagalaz. To start, I wanted to cover a few important things that you'll need to know, starting with squads. Each mission always features four squad mates, one of which will always be Commander Shepard. Each squad mate will boast different skills, so choose wisely. You can use the same squad mates in each mission of your campaign or change it up. It's totally up to you. Whatever you like to do, that's what you can do. As I mentioned, you will always be using four squad mates, so that means in a game with four players, each player will control a single squad mate. In a game with three players, one player is going to control two squad mates, while the other two will each control one. In a game with two players, each player will control two squad mates. And finally, of course, in a solo game, you're going to control all four squad mates on your own. Next, let's talk about war readiness. At the end of the campaign, the player's level of success is determined by how many war readiness points they have scored. War readiness is scored each time the squad completes a mission and can also be scored by completing secondary objectives during a mission. Each mission will have clearly defined parameters for victory and defeat, and victory is actually going to come in two varieties. There's Paragon Victory, which usually requires extra effort but scores higher war readiness, and Renegade Victory, which is typically a more ruthless and efficient path to victory. Whether a mission ends in victory or defeat, the squad will always advance to the next mission and continue the campaign. However, if the first two missions are failed, the squad fails its assignment and the campaign is going to end early. But don't worry, you can just start again. Like nobody saw what happened, okay? You just start from scratch. Totally fine. As I mentioned, you are going to choose four squad mates for your mission. Now is probably a good time to tell you a little bit more about each of them. Let's start with Commander Shepard. Commander Shepard is an all capable, well-rounded leader who makes the squad more than the sum of its parts. You'll remember from what I said earlier, Commander Shepard must be a part of your squad, so somebody must choose him. Just like in the video game, Commander Shepard is versatile. They have two different miniatures, but you'll only need to use one each time you play, so choose your favorite. They don't change how they play, but you will notice on their squad sheet uh, that they're the same, but they just have a different picture. 
Next up, we have Garrus Vakarian. Garrus Vakarian grants the squad several options for powerful, precise ranged attacks. Then we have Lyra Tassani. Lyra unleashes powerful biotic effects to predict, negate, and impede enemy action. Next, we have Talizora Naraya. Talizora fights alongside her faithful combat drone Chatika, Vow Paws, sabotaging defenses and unlocking doors. And finally, Erdnot Rex. Erdnot is a master of close range combat and a defensive powerhouse. Choose your squad wisely, but don't forget somebody must play as Commander Shepard. They are your leader after all, so you can't just leave them behind. Like I mentioned in the intro, you will need to complete three main missions. However, during the campaign, you will also have the option to attempt up to two loyalty missions, which take place between the main missions. Each of Shepard's squad mates has a unique loyalty mission. By undertaking their loyalty mission, Shepard builds a stronger bond with the squad mate, and if the mission is successful, it unlocks a unique ability for them. Just be aware, time is short, so you won't be able to attempt every loyalty mission in a single playthrough. So choose wisely, and if you prefer a shorter campaign, which is totally fine, you can just skip the loyalty missions entirely. And lastly, before we really dive in, I just wanted to mention that there are two types of enemies that you're going to encounter. Minions, which are numerous foes that appear in multiple missions, and elites, which are tough boss level adversaries. We're gonna talk more about those as we continue the how to play, but just know those are the two types of enemies that you are going to be encountering in Mass Effect. All right, let's take a look at some of your key components so you can become familiar with all the different things that you're going to need to manage in this game. This is your mission book, and this is your narrative book. The narrative book contains a series of numbered story paragraphs. At various points, you will be instructed to read a specifically numbered paragraph. So you should avoid reading any paragraphs that you have not been told to read uh, because nobody likes spoilers, right? So just don't do that. The mission book is made up of a number of mission spreads, one for each mission the squad can attempt. A spread is made up of a mission rules page which shows things like setup instructions, enemy forces, mission objectives, and any special rules applicable to this particular mission. And a mission map page which will act as the game board during play. Let's take a closer look using Mission 1A as the example. Up here, you will have a text box that is a narrative introduction into the scenario. So make sure that you read this out loud to the entire group when you start your mission. Here we have our enemy forces. This is going to tell you what types of hazard cards, as well as what types of minions and how many of those minion enemies you are going to need to put into the enemy bag which is this bag right here. Now, one thing that isn't on mission 1A, but you can find on mission 1B as an example, this is what the additional rules section will look like in a mission. I'm not gonna show you anything beyond that because once again, nobody likes spoilers. In these boxes here, you will find the objectives for the mission. The color of the box is going to determine the type of objective that you're looking at. So, gray is your preliminary objective. This is what is going to allow you to complete the mission. Then we have our secondary objective in the yellow box, and then in blue, our paragon, and red, our renegade. Remember, you can get a paragon victory or a renegade victory. These boxes are gonna tell you how that happens. And they're also gonna tell you what story paragraphs you need to read. So just pay very close attention to your objective boxes. Now, we've already talked about our minion enemy forces, but down at the bottom, we will have the elite enemy forces section, which is going to tell you what type of elite enemies need to be used in this mission. Then we have our mission failure box. So this is going to tell you what happens if you fail the mission. The mission is going to fail 
if Shepard is downed, and we're going to talk about that soon. But just know this is going to give you some more information about mission failure. There may also be different areas that you can see with these little circles where you can collect progress. So that is going to be where you track your progress. So that's what the little bubbles are for. All right, let's talk about how you interact with the map. Now, each mission map represents an enclosed area. Anything outside of the grid of hexes is considered out of bounds, meaning characters cannot move out of the grid unless a mission rule specifically allows them to do so. All of that will, of course, be outlined in your mission book in the additional rules. Any two hexes sharing a border are adjacent unless the border features a wall or a locked door. Obstacles do not prevent hexes from being adjacent. Let me show you an example of this. As you can see here, these highlighted sections are the walls. So anywhere that you see a highlighted section, that is going to be a wall. Between this hex, this hex, this hex, this whole section here, there are no walls, but you can very clearly see the walls identified in this section of the map. On these sections here, that's actually where we're going to be placing doors. Now the doors have their own tokens and you will see whether or not they are open or if they are closed. Now, of course, different things in the game are going to be able to affect this, meaning that a once open door can become closed and a once closed door, of course, can become open. This icon that you see kind of scattered throughout the map, this is a spawn hex. Now, during your mission, you are going to be spawning different enemies during your gameplay. These spawn hexes are going to identify different sections where they will be able to spawn. Here, we are gonna be placing objective tokens on the question marks. Now, these can be interacted with during a mission. Consider them to be points of interest that you're going to be able to interact with. On these sections here, we will be placing loot tokens. This is another type of token that you can interact with throughout the mission. There are a variety of different kinds of loot that you're going to be able to discover, which we'll get into shortly, but just know that that's what these tokens are. We've already talked about the spawn icon, but we also have another spawn icon that we haven't mentioned yet, and that is for our elite enemies. This symbol here is where elite enemies will be spawned. Now the map we're currently currently looking at doesn't feature this next token, but I still want to show you. This is a refugee token. Now on some of the missions and maps, you're actually going to be able to rescue civilians, aka refugees, who are scattered throughout the map. So if the mission tells you to place out a refugee token, this is the token that you're going to be placing out. On some of the maps, you will also have turret status locations. We are going to get into turrets a little bit later, but if you see this symbol here, you are going to be placing out a turret on its active side, which has the arrow face up. You will notice an inactive side has an X, so make sure to put those with the active side up. Then you'll notice these purple sections here. Now they may look like walls, but they're actually not walls. These are obstacles. So obstacles don't prevent movement or adjacency. However, they will affect attacks. So keep your eye out for those obstacles. And the last thing on the map you'll see here, these are the squad mates starting locations. When you put your squad mates out onto the map for the first time, you will select where you would like to put your squad mate. So one thing that you're going to encounter in this game is you're going to have to count distances between hexes. So let's talk about that using this map as an example. To do this, you're going to count the shortest route from the first hex to the second, moving only between adjacent hexes. Remember, you cannot pass through walls or locked doors because you're not a ghost, so you can't do that. So the distance between Commander Shepard and this husk enemy is going to be one, two, three. If Commander Shepard had been in this space and we were trying to count the hexes to the husk enemy, it is going to be one, two, three, four. Let's move on to line of fire. 
Some rules allow a character to attack or otherwise affect a target within its line of fire. All right, so for line of fire, just imagine there are six straight lines radiating out of the character's hex. A target within one of these lines is within the character's line of fire, as long as there are no walls, doors, locked or unlocked, or obstacles directly between them. So let me show you a little example. Here we have Commander Shepard, and then we have two husk enemies. Now, one of these husk enemies is within the line of fire. So if we see right here, the line of fire will go and hit this husk here. This enemy is not within the line of fire. However, if they were here, they would be. Next, let's talk about shrouded areas. Some mission maps are made up of multiple different areas separated by walls and doors. At the start of a mission, any area that does not contain at least one squad mate is shrouded. Enemies in shrouded areas do not activate and cannot be targeted by attacks or abilities. Just think of it as that they're like totally hidden, all right? So if you'll see here, this husk is very obviously in a shrouded area, surrounded by walls, the door is locked, and there are no squad mates there. So we will turn him to his stunned side, just showing that he's not really got much going on right now. A shrouded area will be revealed when a squad mate stands in a hex bordered by an unlocked door leading into the area. Now if Commander Shepard had been here, well they're still shrouded because that door is locked. However, if the door becomes open, this area is no longer shrouded and the husk will reveal themselves. It's important to know that when a squad mate moves into a hex containing one or more loot tokens, those tokens are flipped face up and added to the squad's inventory. Placing them next to Shepard's squad mate sheet, these tokens are available to any squad mate to use, okay? Let's just say we moved in here and there is a little loot token. Well, we're gonna take that, we can flip it over and see what it is, and then we'll place it next to Commander Shepard's squad mate sheet. Since we're already talking about loot tokens, let's maybe take a closer look at the types of loot tokens that you can encounter. You have grenade and grenade cash tokens, which allow you to pick a target hex in the squad mate's line of fire and within three hexes. Each enemy in the target hex or adjacent to it suffers two damage if you discard a grenade token or three damage if you discard a grenade cash token. This can be done at the start or end of any action. Next, we have metagel tokens, which can be discarded at the start or end of any action that a squad mate makes. They can be used on themselves or another squad mate within two hexes. The chosen squad mate will immediately recover two hit points. Finally, there are Intel Cash Tokens, which can be discarded at the end of a mission. For each Intel Cash Token that is in the squad's inventory, mark an empty Intel Gathered box on the campaign map. We're going to talk about that campaign map really soon. All right, last note for the mission map. When the squad faces Cerberus forces, the map will also show a number of turrets. Remember, we talked about that earlier. Characters can freely enter a hex containing a turret. Each turret has a line of fire in a similar way to a character, however, unlike a character's line of fire, a turret's line of fire includes its own hex, but only extends in a single direction indicated by the arrow. A turret's line of fire never changes, so they can be avoided with relative ease. When a turret is disabled, we simply flip the token to its disabled side, which shows the X. It no longer has line of fire and cannot deal damage. Okay, let's move over to your squad mate sheets. Now each squad mate has a unique sheet which will sit in front of the player controlling them. This is essentially like your control panel, tracking all information, listing all the squad mate special rules, their unique abilities. So let's just take a closer look at one of those squad mate sheets. We are going to use Lyara as our example. So let's take a look. Now each squad mate sheet is double sided. So just so you know, there's stuff on the front and the back. So the first thing we're going to look at up here is where we're actually going to be able to place dice out in order to take 
actions. You will be able to place a die on any of these spots so long as it has a matching icon. Next, we have our core ability, and that's gonna be in this red box right here. So in this instance, the core ability is called analysis. This box is going to explain everything that you need to know about that core ability, so make sure you read before you start playing. Then we have a squad mate's shield points, and once the shields are gone, then we have the hit points. Here we have a section for our experience points. So as the game progresses, characters are gonna be gaining different experience points, which you get to mark off with this handy dandy white erase marker. Yeah, it says Mass Effect right on it, pretty cool. So in addition to the basic actions that a character can take as well as their core ability, they also have some other abilities that can be utilized, which you can see in these blue boxes right here, which then leads us into the boxes here that have a black background. At the start of the game, you are only going to have access to the abilities with a blue background. You are going to need to upgrade and unlock the different abilities that you see with a black background as the game continues. When you are able to unlock one of those special abilities, you simply check it off so that you know that you now have access to this ability. Then you'll notice we also have some that are surrounded by red. Now these are advanced abilities and they can't be unlocked until you have met the specific requirements outlined on them. And then last but not least, on this side, you will have your special loyalty ability, which can't be unlocked until you have successfully completed that loyalty mission, which will then, of course, allow you to unlock that ability. There are three ways those squad mates' abilities can be unlocked. Number one, the squad mate earns enough XP. So as you can see here, the little up arrow is going to allow you to unlock an ability. Another way is that an intel gathered box with an icon is marked, which you can see here on the campaign map, which we'll get to later, but it would be that little up arrow right there. And the third way is that the players are instructed to unlock an ability by a story paragraph. When your squad mate runs out of hit points, they are considered downed and their squad mate sheet is flipped face down. When this happens, just follow the instructions on the sheet and as soon as another squad mate revives you, you'll be back in the fight. However, if Commander Shepard is downed, the mission ends in failure, so protect them at all costs. You will also have a campaign map. The campaign map tracks the squad's progress through the crashed cruiser, mission by mission. Each mission has its own box on the map and they're split into three stages. You will play one mission from stage one, one from stage two, and one from stage three, following one of the paths after each mission to determine which one will come next. So you choose which level one mission you would like to complete. And let's say we go with 1A, through the breach. You can then go up here and potentially do a loyalty mission. Then from there, you have a decision to make. Remember, you don't have to do a loyalty mission. You may choose to do a loyalty mission. So if you choose not to, you can go directly from 1A, but then you have to choose to either do 2A or 2B. Let's say we went with 2B, Atlas Binary. So in the same way as before, once you complete this mission, you are then going to need to make another decision, and that's to either go up through here or here. Once again, you have a choice to do a loyalty mission, but it is not required. So then you're gonna choose either 3A or 3B. So as you can probably gather, that means that you can mix and match and do a variety of different combinations of those three missions, including or excluding loyalty missions. One thing you will be doing a lot of in this game is marking boxes. To mark a box, you'll just fill it in using this wet erase marker included in the box, and that means when the campaign is over, you can clear it all by wiping it down, okay? Like, it just start over. 
If you failed big time, you just start over, wipe it off, and it's like it never happened. When a mission ends, either through victory or defeat, you're going to need to mark that down on the campaign map as well. And you'll remember there are two types of victories. Paragon, which is this blue symbol here, and Renegade, which is the red symbol. So if you have won with a Paragon victory, you will check off the box next to the blue symbol. If it's Renegade, next to the red symbol. And whoopsies, if you were defeated, well, you're going to have to check it off next to that X. The waypoints, which are these little circles here, are going to determine what you decide to do next. When selecting a loyalty mission to do, you're also going to need to mark off which character, which squad mate it corresponds to. And last but not least, when you score war readiness points, you're going to track those along the war readiness track along the bottom of your campaign map. All right, let's talk about enemies and take a look at the enemy tokens. Both minions and elites are represented by tokens. The front of the token is considered the active side, while the back is considered the stun side, which you'll be able to easily identify because the back is gray and has a lightning bolt. That means they are stunned. At the top of the token, you'll have the name right here, then in the star, the attack value, in the shield, their defense value. You may also find a tag, which we'll go over a little bit later. And on the flip side, you'll also see a challenge level, which is used to determine which minion tokens are actually used in each mission. It is important to note that elite enemies will vary from mission to mission and have their own rules box on the mission page, which will show you their token, their spawn icon, and a special rule applying to them. Let's talk about setting up a mission and we are going to use mission 1A through the breach as our example. We will start by prepping for our mission. So we're going to consult with the campaign map to see which mission we will be attempting and then open the mission book to that spread. Then you're going to place the mission book in the center of the table within reach of all players. Please make sure to read the mission rules page and check for any additional setup instructions. If any instructions in the box contradict setup that I'm about to cover, the rules box will take precedent. There are no special setup rules in 1A, so just so you know, this is going to be the most basic kind of setup. Now we will build the enemy bag. All right, we're going to find the 30 minion tokens that match those shown in the enemy forces box on the mission rules page. So in this example, we need five assault troopers, five guardians, and five engineers. So we have our five assault troopers, our five engineers, and our five guardians. You may have noticed that before I said from the 30, there are a total of 30 10 of each of these types of enemies. However, you'll remember that we are also going to be looking at the challenge level, and this is mission one, so our challenge level is low. So we have selected the ones that have the low challenge level. So because we are playing a low mission, we have returned all of the medium and extreme tokens back to the box. But it's important to note that if it's a medium challenge, you will use both the low and medium returning extreme back to the box. And if it's extreme, well, you're not putting any back in the box, okay? All right, now we're going to place the required enemy tokens in the enemy bag. Give it a good shake. Next, we're going to find the matching hazard deck. So we have two types of hazard decks. We have Cerberus and Reaper. So you're going to check the mission rules to figure out which one that you need. Cerberus will be in orange and it will say Cerberus and Reaper will be in purple and will say Reaper. So we are going to take the matching hazard deck and in mission 1A, that is the Cerberus deck, we're going to shuffle it and place it face down next to the mission book, returning the other hazard deck to the game box. Then we're gonna find the elite enemies once again, shown on the mission rules page, and we're gonna place them in their matching spawn locations. So here we see we need Weimer Mech and Weimer Mech, so that's two Weimer Mechs, but they do look slightly different. So this Weimer Mech here is showing that its spawn point is going to be the orange spawn point for elites, which we can find right here on the map. 
Whereas this one is going to be on the blue spawn point, which we can find right here. Then we are going to place a random minion token from the enemy bag into each spawn hex active side up, unless, we'll remember, unless they're in shrouded areas. So in this instance, we'll place one here, 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 and here. Next, we are going to shuffle the 12 loot tokens together face down, and we're gonna place one face down on each hex that contains a loot icon. Here, 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 and that's it. Then we'll take a look at the map and see what other types of tokens we need to place down. So remember, there are objectives, refugees, locked and unlocked doors, turret status tokens, etc. We are going to find the tokens that match those on the map. For 1A, we have some turrets. So we're gonna make sure that we place those active side up. Then we have some objective tokens, which we are going to place on the question marks. Make sure you check your additional rules and objective boxes on your mission page for your current mission to make sure that you don't miss anything. Lastly, you'll deploy your squad. So once again, we're going to choose our squad mates, making sure one of them is Commander Shepard for the mission. Take the squad mate sheet and miniature for your squad mate you're controlling. On your squad mate sheet, make sure that you are placing a tracking cube on the rightmost space of your shields and your hit points. Now, some of the squad mates may have other things that they need to keep track of. For Lyara, we need to place a cube in her analysis tracker, so don't forget to do that. Then, starting with Shepard and going clockwise around the board, place each squad mate's miniature in a start hex that does not already contain a squad mate. Place the on point token and the 12 strategy dice next to Shepard's squad mate sheet. Add one Paragon die for each Paragon victory marked on your campaign map. That's these blue dice right here. Each player will take a Renegade token for each Renegade victory that is marked on the campaign map and place it next to their squad mate sheet. Now, obviously, we're doing the first scenario, first mission here, so we wouldn't have any, but just so you know, those are the Renegade tokens. Finally, place any remaining components within reach of all players. Now you're ready to begin your mission, which means it's time to talk about sequence of play. Each mission will be played over a series of rounds and each round is made up of three phases. The preparation phase, the squad mate phase, and the end phase. You will continue like this until you reach either victory or defeat. Before we get into the phases, it is important to know that each round, one squad mate will be considered on point. This will be shown by placing the on point token next to their squad mate sheet. They will take the first turn in the round and their player may have some additional duties during play. Commander Shepard will always be on point at the start of a mission, but the on point token will pass to a new squad mate at the end of each round. Let's start with the preparation phase. First thing we're going to do is draw a hazard card for each squad mate and place it face down next to their squad mate sheet without looking at it. If a squad mate is downed, no hazard card is drawn for them. Remember, a squad mate is down when they run out of HP and their sheet is turned face down. Then the on point player will take the 12 strategy dice to form the strategy pool. It is possible that some dice are locked by a down squad mate, so just know this will reduce the size of the overall strategy pool. Let's take a look at the strategy pool. During their turn, each player rolls the pool and then chooses three dice from it to make actions. Whee! That's fun to roll a lot of dice, not gonna lie to you. So this means that the pool is going to get smaller over the course of the round, so players whose squad mate goes earlier will have more options available to them. So as the on point player, and I have rolled the 12 strategy die, that means that I have all 12 to choose from so I can take whatever I like. Next up, the squad mate phase. In the squad mate phase, each squad mate will take a turn starting with the on point squad mate and continuing clockwise around the table. A squad mate's turn has three steps which happen in order. Strategy roll, actions, and hazard card. For the strategy roll, the player picks up all of the dice that remain in the strategy pool 
and rolls them. Before you roll the strategy pool, you can choose to lock a single die rolled by the previous player, keeping the result that it showed at the end of their turn. Just note this can't be done for the on point squad mate strategy roll as they're going to be first in the round, so they must always roll all of the dice in the pool. This is probably a good time to show you the faces of the strategy die and what they all do. We have move. The move icons are indicated by arrows. We have a standard action, which is indicated by this symbol here. We also have an enhanced action, which looks very similar, but it has a colored in blue background. The star is for a core ability, and then we also have one die face that shows both a standard ability as well as a movement icon. When a player rolls a strategy pool, each of these star icons will trigger the current squad mate's core ability. Once this has been resolved, the player will re-roll any dice showing the star icon. You will repeat this process, triggering core abilities and then re-rolling until there are no star results remaining. As an example, let's take a look at Rex. So Rex's core ability is Blood Rage. So anytime that we roll one of these stars, we're going to be able to flip his calm tokens, one of his calm tokens for each star, to the enraged side, which we will then later be able to use to uh, do some serious damage. The next up is actions. A squad mate can take up to three actions on their turn. To take an action, select a die from the strategy pool and allocate it to an action space on your squad mate sheet, showing a matching icon, and then you'll resolve the corresponding action. We have three basic actions, move, mission, and revive. These will be at the top of your squad mate sheet. For a move, you will assign a movement die to one of the movement die spots. This will indicate how many movement points you will have, and it will either be two or three, depending on which die was allocated. Each movement point lets you move your squad mate into an adjacent hex. Any points that are not spent by the end of the action are lost. It is important to know that a squad mate can move into a hex containing another squad mate as long as it does not end its action there. A squad mate cannot move into a hex containing an enemy, and if a squad mate is adjacent to an enemy and moves so it is no longer adjacent to that enemy, it will provoke an opportunity attack. This will deal damage to the squad mate equal to the enemy's attack value, and if multiple enemies make opportunity attacks, they are resolved one at a time starting with the enemy with the highest attack value and continuing in order from highest to lowest. If a rule forces a squad mate to move, this does not provoke an opportunity attack, okay? So there's only if you move by choice. Let me just show you what I mean here. So once again, we've got Rex here and we are going to place this movement die here. That is giving us two movement points. So Rex can move. One, two, if he would like. Now, if he was already here and he decided to go one, two, and he's moved away from this enemy, that will trigger the opportunity attack. Next up, we have mission, and we can assign these little exclamation marks to those mission spaces. A die can only be allocated to this action if there is a rule on the mission rules page that allows this to happen. When this is the case, the rules will explain what happens when a die is allocated here. Then, last but not least, we have revive. When a die is allocated here, choose a downed squad mate in an adjacent hex. That squad mate is revived, following the instructions on the back of their squad mate sheet. So let's just say Rex has been downed. So if Rex were downed and their sheet was flipped over, this is what it would look like. When somebody is down, so if it's Commander Shepard's turn, they can choose to revive Rex. Then we're gonna follow the revived instructions that are shown here on the back of Rex's squad mate sheet. In addition to the basic actions that are available to all squad mates, each squad mate has a number of unique actions available in their ability boxes. 
When a die is allocated to an action space in an ability box, you will resolve the text in the box. At the start of the campaign, you will remember that only ability boxes with the solid blue backgrounds are available. Black backgrounds can be unlocked throughout the missions. As an example, Rex has Rex not happy and shotgun blast available to them right away. So if Rex wanted to assign one of these exclamation die to Rex not happy, they can do that. Then it says to flip all of your blood rage tokens to their comm side. So that's exactly what we would do. For each token flipped, deal one damage to an adjacent enemy. Boom, boom, boom. Many actions allow squad mates to deal points of damage to enemies. This is tracked by placing damage tokens next to the enemy. If the total amount of damage suffered by an enemy equals or exceeds its shield value, the enemy is defeated and defeated minions are returned to the enemy bag. Now, defeated elites are just simply removed from the board. Defeating an enemy using an ability will also award one XP, so make sure that you grab that wet erase marker and cross off one XP in the corresponding missions column. So we're doing mission 1A, so we would put it right at the top here of M1. At the end of a round, all damage tokens allocated to enemies are removed from the mission map. This represents your enemy shields recharging. So make sure that you pick your targets carefully because you could be doing all that work, doing the damage, and then the round's gonna end and they just heal, so do a lot of damage. Now the way that damage is dealt and tracked on an elite is different than with a minion. So as soon as the damage suffered by an elite enemy is equal to the current top shield value on its resilience tracker, that shield is exhausted. Any excess damage from that attack is disregarded. So to show this, you're going to mark the shield values progress box and remove all damage tokens from the enemy. You must then exhaust the next level of shield value down until none remain. Once the last level of shield value has been exhausted, then the enemy is defeated and the squad mate who inflicted the last point of damage will gain one XP. And you'll remember the elites are just put back in the box. Some squad mates have the ability to give enemies biotic effect tokens. These are placed on the enemy in the same way as a damage token and stay in place until the end of the round. An enemy token with a biotic effect token counts its attack value as two lower to a minimum of zero. An enemy token cannot have more than one biotic effect token. A good example of this is with Lyara who uses the bio effect tokens in many of her actions. Once there are three dice on a squad mate sheet, the action step of the turn is over. Note that a squad mate must always take three dice from the pool on their turn. If they do not wish to make the three actions, they can just place a dice matching the action spaces without resolving the actions themselves. Finally, the hazard card step. Once a squad mate has made their actions, the player will flip the hazard card next to their squad mate sheet. So it's face up, then they're going to resolve it and finally place it face up into the discard pile next to the hazard deck. If the hazard deck ever runs out, simply shuffle the discards and create a new face down deck. Most hazard cards will instruct the player to activate one or more enemies. When multiple enemies are activated, do this one at a time, starting with the one that is closest to the squad mate who just took their turn and moving outwards. When there is a choice of enemies to activate, you get to choose. Lucky you. Enemies that are stunned, however, are not activated and you'll remember a stunned enemy is flipped over to its stun sign so it's easily indicated. So as an example, this hazard card says activate each elite enemy. So that is telling you you need to activate the enemies that are elite. We also have escalation cards and defense turret cards. So there is a range of different cards in your hazard deck. Just make sure that you read them carefully and activate as instructed. So an activated enemy will attack a squad mate if it is adjacent to one or if it has a ranged tag and there's a squad mate in its line of fire. If it cannot make an attack, 
it will advance instead. Um, this is probably a good time to tell you about the enemy tags that you will see on their tokens. We talked about that forever ago. Time to revisit. Let's start with the pin tag. Immediately after an enemy with a pin tag makes an opportunity attack, the squad mate's move action ends, even if it still has movement points left. You're pinned. Next is ranged. An enemy with the range tag can attack non-adjacent squad mates as long as they are within its line of fire. Then we have react. If an enemy with the react tag takes damage and is not defeated, it immediately moves one hex towards the squad mate that inflicts the damage as though it were advancing. The player controlling that squad mate can choose the specific hex it moves into as long as it ends the move as close to the attacking squad mate as possible. And finally, rush. An enemy with the rush tag can use up to four movement points when advancing instead of two. More on advancing soon, we've mentioned that quite a lot in these tags. But before we get into that, let's talk about enemy attack. First, select a target for the enemy. Each squad mate that is adjacent to an enemy is a potential target. If the enemy has a range tag, each squad mate in its line of fire is also a potential target. The enemy will attack whichever potential target has the fewest hit points remaining before they are downed. If two or more potential targets have an equally low hit point, well, it's up to you. The current squad mate player gets to choose. When a squad mate is attacked, they suffer damage equal to the enemy's attack value. So let's use this guardian as an example. They are being activated and they want to attack. Well, they actually have two squad mates in their line of fire and they just so happen to have that range icon. So in their line of fire, and you'll remember, it's the six areas around that go straight out. However, Tally is blocked by an obstacle, so she's not really going to be considered in this attack. Now, let's just say for the sake of examples purposes that both Commander Shepard and Rex have the same amount of hit points available. So the Guardian is going to attack whomever is closest, which is Rex. Their attack value is two. So they are going to do two hits of damage to Rex. Now the first thing that we're going to do, and each time a squad mate suffers a point of damage, they will first lose a shield point, which is tracked with this blue cube. So for two, they would go one, two. Now if this had been later in the game and they were out of shields, they would then need to move their hit point tracker down. And you'll remember as soon as the hit tracker gets down to the bottom, well, you're downed and you gotta flip your sheet and someone's gonna have to come along and bring you back to life. And just remember, if Shepard is downed, the mission immediately ends in failure. So like I mentioned, if the enemy is unable to attack, they will instead advance using two movement points. Each movement point lets an enemy move into an adjacent hex and any points that are not spent by the end of the activation are lost. An enemy cannot move into a hex containing another character. If possible, the enemy must end its move so that it is in a position to attack the current squad mate. Otherwise, it must end its move so that it's in a position to attack the nearest squad mate. Otherwise, it just moves as far as possible towards the nearest squad mate. So in this example, this assault trooper does not have range, so it doesn't have line of fire, and it's not adjacent to a squad mate, so it would need to advance. And it will advance two movement points. It's trying to get as close as it can to the current squad mate or to the nearest squad mate, but at this point in time, they're all pretty much equidistant. So it's gonna go as far as it can go. Now, if it had been here, it is going to advance to the current active squad mate, which is Rex, and it's gonna get as close as it can. Some hazard cards will also instruct the player to spawn a minion at a specific spawn hex, usually the one that is closest to or furthest from the current squad mate. Only empty spawn hexes are counted, and if a spawn hex already contains a character, it's ignored. 
So let's use this card as our example. Spawn a minion to the closest empty spawn hex to the current squad mate and then activate the minion. So if our current squad mate is Rex, well the closest spawn point is right next to him. To spawn a minion, we are going to draw a random token from the enemy bag and we will place it in the corresponding hex. If all spawn hexes are occupied, then minions cannot be spawned. If a hazard card instructs you to activate an enemy type and no enemies of that type are currently on the board, spawn a minion at the closest empty spawn hex to the current squad mate. Do this once for each enemy type that cannot be activated. The last phase of the round is the end phase. In the end phase, each squad mate will recover all of their shield points, moving the tracker all the way to the furthest right space. Then remove any damage, biotic effect tokens from all enemies, and flip any stunned enemies that are not in shrouded areas to their active side. Finally, the on point token is passed to the squad mate whose sheet is to the right of the current on point squad mate. If that squad mate is currently downed, well, keep going right until you reach somebody who is not downed. Then a new round begins. A mission can end in one of four ways. The Paragon objective is completed, resulting in a Paragon victory. Paragon objective, remember, will be in a blue box, and this is usually a bit more challenging, but scores more war readiness points. The Renegade objective is completed, resulting in a Renegade victory. Renegade objective will be in a red box, and this is usually more direct route to victory, but scores less war readiness points. Another way is time runs out, resulting in a failure. And the last way is that Shepard is downed, also resulting in a failure. The mission rules page gives instructions on what to do in each case, and generally when the mission ends, you will be instructed to read a story paragraph, mark the outcome on your campaign map, and possibly receive an additional reward of some kind. For a Paragon victory, your bonus is going to come in the form of Paragon dice, which will get added to the strategy pool in each subsequent mission. These allow players to select one or more Paragon dice from the pool in addition to the three dice that are normally allowed to select, meaning you could possibly make four or even five actions in a turn. At the start of each mission, each squad mate will receive a Renegade token for each Renegade victory that has been marked up in the campaign map. After rolling the strategy pool at the start of your turn, but before triggering your core ability, you can return one of the Renegade tokens to the game box uh, and then change the result of a single die. Hmm. Let's talk now about saving the game. You don't need to play through the whole campaign in a single sitting. You are more than welcome to, but you certainly don't need to. Packing the game away is very easy between missions because your progress is recorded by the marks you've made on your campaign map and squad mate sheets. But if you prefer a more high tech option or if you'd like to track multiple campaigns, you can actually scan the QR code that you can find in the rule book and that is going to save your mission for you. Now some mission maps will include icons for different special features. When you encounter these, please refer to the rule book for those special rules. Uh, you can also refer to the rule book for special squad mate commentary. So there's lots of fun extras in the rule book that I definitely would love for you to explore on your own. And that my friends is how you play Mass Effect, the board game Priority Hagalaz from Modifius Entertainment. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave those in the comments below and I will answer them as soon as I can. If you're interested in Mass Effect the board game, check the description of this video for all links and as I mentioned before, you can pre-order this game right now and it will be fully available in October. Thank you all so much for watching. If you are interested in buying board games, remember for Mass Effect, you're gonna to go to the pre-order page, but other board games, you should first start by checking your friendly local gaming store. And for us, that is the Boardroom Game Cafe. And if you like what you see, please consider subscribing. I hope to see you again soon. And now I say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>